back to the definition that I want to give you for the word anointing. It is the burden removing, yoke destroying power of the Most High God. And that is something that all of us, I'm sure, want to have in our lives. Now where we ended up last week is exactly where I'm going to pick up because there's so much I want to share with you. And I don't want to just keep going back and forth with um, review. Also, if you would like the first three CDs, they are always available. And that's for your spiritual enrichment and edification. When we ended up last time, we looked at, and I'm going to have you turn back to Philippians 4, 13. <clears throat> and this is the Apostle Paul writing to us in Philippians 4, 13. Everyone pretty much knows uh, by heart this verse in the New King James Version or the King James Version, which says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We all pretty much know that and we're comfortable with that. I shared it with you out of the Amplified and it says it this way. I can do all things which he has called me to do through him who strengthens and empowers me to fulfill his purpose. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. I am ready for anything and equal to anything, <clears throat> excuse me, through him who infuses me with inner strength and confident trust. In other words, it says, <clears throat> excuse me, okay, I can clear my throat, this is ridiculous. Okay, I can do all things through Christ, the anointed and his anointing, which strengthens me. We talked about the importance of the qualifier in that verse of scripture. To say, okay, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me, that's like saying I could get up here with our praise team and lead it. No, that's not where my anointing lies. So I could get up there and do it, but you would ask me real quickly to hurry up and sit down because that's not what I'm anointed to do. The qualifier in this statement is that we can do all th things that he has called us to do, that he has anointed us to do. That's specifically what it's talking about. Now, <clears throat> many of us, and we talked about this last week, and I even gave you some of my own personal examples of my life, where everyone from time to time is growing through a storm. That we can pretty much count on. The big news, the great news, is that if you are a believer, you have everything available to you to win. And you should win. Now, we, because <laughs> this is a time where, and I'm sure when you really stop and think about it, you can see this happening all around you. Things are changing. They're not like they used to be even five years ago. Forget 10 years ago. Um, how many people remember when Home Depots became like something new? Like, you know, the Home Depot or Costco, you know, the big box stores they call them now. Does everybody kind of remember when they first kind of came on the horizon? Okay, now you all are gonna have to work with me. Because <clears throat> I'm not, you can already see, he's trying to keep me from talking, but we know I win. So here's the point. Do you remember that? Yes or no? Raise your hand. Thank you. That's what I want. Okay. Now, when they came on the scene, it affected a great change for a lot of people. Like, I used to be able to go into the hardware store, you know, say Stan was busy and I just wanted to have a little screw to fix something. I could go to my little local hardware store and ask the gentleman there, okay, I need to fix this. What do I need? He'd walk right over and give it to me. If I go to Home Depot, are you kidding me? First, I gotta try to find somebody. If I'm blessed, somebody will appear. And hopefully, they're in the department that deals with the hardware and not the gardening department, okay? It changed, but it put a lot of people who have those wonderful small businesses out of business, okay? So what were they supposed to do? Well, we're now living in a time when a lot of people are, <laughs> Companies are, I'll put it this way, companies are downsizing. Like we already know that Amazon just bought Whole Foods. We know that all of the different phone companies are conglomerates and they all got together. Remember there used to just be Ma Bell, everybody knew that. Now there are so many different phone companies you don't even know which one to choose from. Everybody's merging. Well, what does that happen to the people who had those particular jobs? People are finding themselves now you know,
know, at 50, 60, 65 years old, first of all, people used to retire and have retirement plans where they retired. They could live off of their retirement and everything was fine. They could sit on the front porch, drink their sweet tea and lemonade and all was well. Now, you find people who are 75 going on 80 years old looking for work. And they're not looking for it just because they have nothing better to do with their time. They're looking for it because they need the income. We know that mothers used to be the people who stayed and worked at home. Notice I said worked, because being at home, <laughs> like my daughter puts it, the one with the three children, she goes to work to rest. Because to stay home with those three kids under four is no rest. The point being is things are completely changing. And we, as believers, have to recognize that and we have to become sensitive to it. Because somewhere along the line, it, the changes may knock on your door and affect you. Okay, You may be sitting with a business that you had that was thriving for years, like the little hardware store that I mentioned, who all of a sudden had to close his doors. Well, what do you think happened to his family? What was he supposed to do? Just go get a job at Home Depot? It's not quite the same thing. There are people who have had work for years who are going to find that their company is downsizing. They no longer lead, need them. They're out of work. If you're out of work, it says if man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. Well, what is he supposed to do? We now have to reinvent ourselves. That's what the world tells us, okay? Well, just go back to school. Okay, tell me what 68-year-old man wants to just go back to school to try to reinvent himself. It is not quite that simplistic. Now, you see, people don't talk about these things. That's why I get these assignments, okay? Because I'm misauthentic. I bring it right down to where we live. This is what we are dealing with. But how do we deal with that? And what does that have to do with us as believers? This is what it has to do with. And this is a very interesting assignment that's been on my heart for a while. And this last week, I haven't been able to just push it aside. Because the one thing that I see and experience with my family of believers is that we are not, generally speaking, walking in the victory that we sing about. We are not walking in the authority that's been given us. And I want to know why. So what do I do? <laughs> I go to the Father. And I'm asking him, why is that? Why is it that I have phone call after phone call and I'm sharing with one person after another person and I know they love God? That's not a question. I know they love God. Why is it that they don't have this victory? And he gave me a glimpse. First of all, I want every single one of you who's sitting here to know that you are a masterpiece. If you go and look in any museum in the world and see the most prized painting or portrait and they tell you it's worth, I don't know, $25 million or whatever, know that you were worth more. Every single part of your being, the earwax in your ears, okay? God created that. There is no part of you that is an error or a mistake. And you need to start zoning in on that because the world doesn't tell us that. Okay, for any woman who is alive, open up any fashion magazine and you could sit there and within 50 seconds, well, not even, you can give yourself 30 seconds, you can find out something wrong with how you look because there's always going to be something you need to improve upon. Okay, that's what they're telling us. But here's what I want you to zone in on. What are you believing for yourself? And here's where the difficulty comes in. And this is where I need you to really stay with me. Your belief system begins in the cradle. Think about this. I'm telling you that my name is Iva Johnson and that I was born 
on January 6, 1956. Now, when it's all said and done, I don't know that, except that that's what my parents told me. So I believe that because I believe them. I mean, think about it. I could actually be somebody else with a different name, and it would be great if I was born at a different time, <laughs> okay? But I really am 61. I mean, it would be nice to know if I was a different age. But the point is, your belief system starts with what you're told from the time you can first recognize understanding anything. Now, we have youngsters in the audience today, so I have to be careful and clever in how I explain this. We start telling our children fables, okay? Because we let them think that their Christmas presents on Christmas morning got there a specific way. Now, I won't go into more because we have little ones here and I don't know what they've been told, okay? We continue telling them these things when it comes to the Easter Bunny, not Resurrection Sunday, but the Easter Bunny. Uh, we then go and further and tell them that when they lose their teeth, instead of explaining to them that it is a process of life and it means that they are growing and getting stronger and healthier, we tell them that it's great to lose their teeth for what they will find under their pillow and then we tell them who's going to put it there. The point that I'm making to you is our belief system becomes tainted with these things because do these things line up with the Word of God? Can we take these things I just mentioned to you and put them in the Word of God and be able to prove them? We know that the Word is what? Truth. So when we do these things, now I'm not beating you up if you did them. I'm just trying to share the point with you of how it affects your belief system. Now you say, okay, that's fine, that's when I was a child. What does that mean now? When you think of Disneyland, do you think of submarines? No. When you think of Disneyland, you think of Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and the characters of Disneyland, correct? What I submit to you is that many believers have gotten to the point that when they think of Jesus, they think of him as coming to church on Sunday, reading our Bibles, they think of him as a mere character. They don't grasp who he truly is, first and foremost. Second of all, and this is what I need you to get if you get nothing else, they don't grasp that they are truly joint heirs with Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Because the way in which we're programmed from little children with our belief system, we just see Jesus as this person, and you know the pictures you saw growing up of what they told you Jesus looked like. Did Jesus really look like that according to the scripture? No, he did not. But that's what we were told. And for many of us, if we pay attention to our history, see, I'm not a big advocate of, like I'm not calling Ancestry.com to find out who my ancestors were, because to be perfectly honest with you, I don't give a care. My ancestry is the fact that I am a descendant of Abraham. That's what I want to know. I don't really care if this person came from, that's just me. Now, if you all want to get in, that's fine if that's what you want to do. But what I'm saying is we need to be able to look around and every single person sitting here, I don't care their hue, I don't care what country they were born in, if they profess Jesus, they are your family. Period. That's it. That is the bottom line. But if you don't grasp that, not because it's cute and it's politically correct and it's a nice thing to say, but if you don't grasp it in your heart, I don't need to stand here and tell you anything about the anointing because you're going to think that just goes along with the character of Jesus and that's cute. And that's not what we're trying to do here. And I want you to think on this because 
it seems simplistic, but it's not because it is it affects your belief system. It affects everything that you believe moving forward. Your relationship with Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You are also a joint heir with the Most High God. Do you recognize that? So when somebody comes at you and they give you some kind of negative words or negative thoughts, it shouldn't even bother you. God is your joint heir. You should see yourself seated in the throne room of the Most High God. And you shouldn't even think about coming out of that throne room for some foolishness that somebody may have shared with you. But you have to see that. You have to see that. I can't make you see it. Here's something else, and I want you to think of it this way. If you go to a family reunion and you meet uh, uh, cousin Ludie Bell. I always use Ludie Bell because I don't know anybody named Ludie Bell, so we usually are safe. But you meet cousin Ludie Bell. You only see Ludie Bell when you go to these reunions, okay? So it's not like you really spend a whole lot of time with her. But you go and you see cousin Ludie Bell, and cousin Ludie Bell is telling you how, well, you know, girl, I have arthritis. And arthritis, well, you know that runs in the family because you know uh, other cousin Pearlie, he had it too. It's all in our bloodline. You go to the doctor because you're finding that it's not as easy to jump up and down stairs or you know, get in and out of chairs. And then the doctor tells you, well, you know, at your age, you have to understand that everybody has arthritis at a certain point in time. And then you have to understand their favorite expression, it's in your genetic gene pool. Now, listen to this. You will sit there, born again, spirit-filled, come to church every single time the door is open, and you will, in the back of your mind, receive it. Even though you may not say you're believing it, you still receive it. And you sit there and go, well, that's true. Cousin Ludy Bell did say that, you know, she had arthritis. But yet and still, now, Cousin Ludy Bell, who you only see once every five or ten years when you guys have these reunions, you take what she says is gospel. But then when I tell you something that Jesus says and you open up the book, it's just a character to you. It's hard for you to imagine that. It's hard for you to grasp that. You've got to adjust your thinking for you to have all that God wants for you. You know, this is the teaching ministry of Apostle Frederick Casey Price. All of us look at him and Dr. Betty and we just marvel at here are these people in their 80s and they're running all around the country. They have more energy than most of us put together. Okay? They look fantastic. They're doing great. They want for nothing, have all the money in the world, have everything in the world that people would love to have. Well, it's because they never looked at Jesus as a character. They adjusted their thinking and they see themselves seated in the throne room. They see themselves as joint heirs with Christ. Turn with me to John's Gospel, the 17th chapter. This to me, well for me personally, again, I can't talk about everybody else. This is and remains my favorite chapter in the whole Bible for this reason. It allowed me to see the heart of my Lord and Savior. It allowed me to see that I serve at the pleasure and am joint heir with someone who truly, unequivocally, unconditionally, beyond a shadow of a doubt, loves me. And this chapter showed that to me. Now, it might not do a thing for you, I don't know. But I would think it's very hard once I share it for you to just not get it. But I want you to listen to it, turn to it if you have it. I'm gonna share it with you out of the Amplified. And I want you to imagine that this is someone closest to you saying it to you. Because this whole chapter is Jesus speaking. Actually, for all of you who, and most of us know because most of us are members here, this is the Lord's Prayer. Not the other thing back over in Matthew where he's talking about, you know, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That was a model prayer. That was not the Lord's Prayer. This is Jesus' prayer. This is the official Lord's Prayer. But I want you to 
If you have it, you can follow along, but I want you to truly listen to it. I want you to listen to it, and I want you to hear Jesus saying this to you, not as some distant character in a book, but as your joint heir, as your personal Lord and Savior saying this. I want you to hear it, okay? So starting with verse 1 in John 17, out of the Amplified, it says this. When Jesus had spoken these things, he raised his eyes to heaven in prayer and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that your son may glorify you. Just as you have given him power and authority over all mankind, now glorify him so that he may give eternal life to all whom you have given him to be his permanently and forever. Now this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true supreme and sovereign God. And in the same manner, know Jesus as the Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you down here on the earth by completing the work that you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory and majesty that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name and revealed your very self, your real self, to the people whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept and obeyed your word. Now, at last, they know with confident assurance that all you have given me is from you. It is really and truly yours. For the words which you gave me, I have given them. And they received and accepted them and truly understood with confident assurance that I came from you, from your presence. And they believed without any doubt that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those you have given me because they belong to you. And all things that are mine are yours, and all things that are yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, yet they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, so that they may be one just as we are. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. And I guarded them and protected them, and not one of them was lost, except the son of destruction, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may experience my joy, made full and complete and perfect within them, filling their hearts with my delight. I have given to them your word, the message you gave me, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world and do not belong to the world, just as I am not of the world and do not belong to it. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but that you keep them and protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth set them apart for your purposes, make them holy. Your word is truth. Just as you commissioned and sent me into the world, I also have commissioned and sent them, believers, into the world. For their sake, I sanctify myself to do your will so that they also may be sanctified, set apart, dedicated, made holy in your truth. I do not pray for these alone, it is not for their sake only that I make this request, but also for all those who will ever believe and trust in me through their message, that they may be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us so that the world may believe without any doubt that you sent me. I have given to them the glory and honor which you have given me, 
that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me. And they may be perfected and completed into one so that the world may know without any doubt that you sent me and that you have loved them just as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given to me as your gift to me, may be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory, which you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, just and righteous Father, although the world has known you and has never acknowledged you, and the revelation of your mercy, yet I have always known you. And these believers know without any doubt that you sent me, and I have made your name known to them and will continue to make it known so that the love which you have loved me may be in them, overwhelming their heart, and I may be in them. Praise God. Praise the Lord. He truly, truly loves you. There is no question about that. He wants you to know that all through this, you heard him saying that we would be one with him and the Father. We are joint heirs. So the point being is, you need to understand that yes, you are an anointed one as we have been discussing through this series. There is an anointing that rests on you to do something. You are not an accident. You are here for a purpose. And I don't give a care if you're 98 years old and you haven't figured out your purpose yet. Guess what? You're still breathing, which means you are still here for that same purpose. You just need to find out what it is and then walk in it. You will find that when you do that, it is just smooth sailing because he will prepare every way for you because there is no one else in the earth realm that can do what he's called you to do or otherwise he wouldn't have called you. You need to understand that. Remember that the anointing is the very power of God at work in whatever situation you are in. I don't care how it may appear, the anointing is working, but you have to believe that. You have to understand that. So when the doctor sits and tells you it's in your genetic gene pool, you can sit up and say, okay, I hear what you're saying. And you don't even have to discuss it with the doctor as far as I'm concerned. You can just hear what he has to say, but then you make sure that you say it and speak to the situation and let them know. That might be what's in my genetic gene pool, but my genetic gene pool was redeemed over 2,000 years ago. You need to be clear on that. And you need to say that, and you need to speak to the situation. Don't just sit there like, okay. No, it's not okay. And then you need to understand that you have Jesus. He is your high priest. He is your intercessor. He, he did all that he could do to provide you with all that you will ever need. There is nothing, nothing that you have need of that has not already been provided. But if you don't believe that, if you don't hold on to that, then if you don't receive it, that's on you. It has nothing to do with God. It has absolutely nothing to do with him. The other thing that I want you to know is, and let's look at Ephesians. Turn to Ephesians really quickly. Yeah, we're going to read that. Ephesians 2, the second chapter of Ephesians, the 10th verse. Let me know when you have it. Okay, great. So if we read it out of the New King James Version, which is what most of you have, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Of course, I really, really like the Amplified. Uh, but before I give you the Amplified, the easy to read says it this way. God has made us what we are. In Christ Jesus, God made us new people so that we would spend our lives doing the good things he had already planned for us to do. Now, if you look at it in the Amplified, it says it this way. For we are his workmanship, his own masterwork, a work of art created in Christ Jesus, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, ready to be used, 
for good works, which God prepared for us beforehand, taking paths which he set, so that we may walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us. That right there confirms that he has a plan, that he's made it ready for us. All we have to do is walk in it. As a Christian, you have a covenant right to expect the power of God in your life to work on your behalf. If you don't expect it, that's on you. It's there, it's available to you. In the midst of the storm, whatever the storm is, you can have peace because it's already been provided. You know, there was a contest, and I think, I, I know I've shared this with you at some point, but it bears repeating. There was a contest of artists once, and there was a big money prize at the end. They had to um, paint a picture that symbolized peace. And whoever was the most effective, you know, the judges would say, okay, fine, and award them the prize. So you can imagine people painted beautiful sunrises and beautiful sunsets and all these glorious scenes of nature that you can imagine that you would, you know, we'd all consider peaceful. You know, a sleeping child, all of these wonderful, peaceful things. Well, none of them won. And, you know, that seems surprising because the person who did win <laughs> actually painted a horrific, tumultuous storm with dark clouds and everything just looked so just horrible. And there was this one pitiful little tree <laughs> that was in the picture. And on this one little branch of the tree that was, it looked like it was blowing in the wind, sat a little bird. And the bird was just at peace. That's the one that won. Because that's the point. I don't care what your storm may be. I don't care how difficult it may look to you you can have peace because the bottom line is you know that the father who created all that there is has made everything available to you to win and if you aren't sure about that now i'm going to turn you to one of my favorite scriptures which is in john's gospel you should kind of be close to there because we just left there really go to john's gospel the 16th chapter and we're going to read verse 33. this is jesus speaking I love this. <laughs> I'm going to share it with you first out of the message and then the Amplified Classic Edition. And I will tell you this, the Amplified Classic Edition, if you don't have it, you need to find it, you need to write it down, commit it to memory, and have it somewhere where you can grab it at any time because it's very, very powerful. In the message it says it this way, Jesus answered them, do you finally believe? In fact, you're about to make a run for it, saving your own skins and abandoning me. But I'm not abandoned. The Father is with me. I've told you all this so that trusting me, you will be unshakable and assured deeply at peace. In this godless world, you will continue to experience difficulties. Take heart. I've conquered the world. Now that says a lot, and that is wonderful. And you need to really think about the fact that, and this is something else that we don't think about. We don't recognize that we truly are his masterpiece, that he created every fiber of our existence. And I want you to know this. While he took that cross and he carried it down the Via Della Rosa that day, before they nailed his hands and feet and went through the torture that they put him through, you need to know that if no other person existed in the earth realm but you, he did it for you. See, we tend to look at it as, oh, it's the masses, he just did this. No, he did it for you. You need to see, when you look up in the heavens and you see all of those stars, yeah, we can pick out constellations, but we can't count all those stars. Well, you, if you pray and ask the Lord to help you with something, he will move the most remote star out of the sky just to put things in line on your behalf. When you go to the beach, and I ask you, if I ask you to count the grains of sand, that's impossible. You have no idea. But you need to know that he will move the most remote grain of sand just 
for you. He loves you just that much. And it's not some character. This is your brother. This is who you need to really get to know. So now I'm gonna read this to you out of the Amplified Classic. And this is Jesus saying it this way. I told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world you have tribulation and trials and distress and frustration. But be of good cheer, take courage, be confident, certain, undaunted, for I have overcome the world. I have deprived it of power to harm you and have conquered it for you. It does not get better than that. When you know that he has done all of that for you, oh, I, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. If you don't get it, it's on you. <laughs> Realize that you alone, you don't have the strength to battle all of these different storms and situations that you may be in and win against them. But you need to take a step back and allow the power of God in your spirit, the anointing, to take over. Then watch the circumstances change. Excuse me, and you know what? In every single instance that you do that, you win. Amen. You win, you win. Now, let's take a few moments because I wanna get a better understanding of the ministry of Jesus. Turn with me to Ephesians, and we're gonna look at chapter four, verses eight through 13. Ephesians four, verses eight through 13. And if we look at it out of the New King James, it says, therefore he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That is stated very, very well. I happen to like the way that it's portrayed a little bit better in the Living Bible, so I'm going to share that. And it says, the psalmist tells about this. For he says that when Christ returned triumphantly to heaven after his resurrection and victory over Satan, see that says a little bit more than the New King James, that's why I like this. Um, when he returned triumphantly to heaven after his resurrection and victory over Satan, he gave generous gifts to men. Notice that it says he returned to heaven. This means that he had first come down from the heights of heaven far down to the lowest parts of the earth. The same one who came down is the one who went back up, that he might fill all things everywhere with himself, from the very lowest to the very highest. Some of us have been given special ability as apostles. To others, he has given the gift of being able to preach well. Some have special ability in winning people to Christ, helping them to trust him as their savior. Still others have a gift for caring for God's people as a shepherd does his sheep, leading and teaching them in the ways of God. Why is it that he gives us these special abilities to do certain things best? Is it that God's people will be equipped to do better work for him, building up the church, the body of Christ to a position of strength and maturity until finally, we all believe alike about our salvation and about our savior, God's son, and all become full grown in the Lord. Yes, to the point of being filled full with Christ. In other words, your salvation was not given to you as an afterthought. You see, if we really spend some time and go back again to think of our history, 
especially any person of color from any, any, any background at all, but especially people who came over here to this country, okay, on slave ships. We have a tendency to just accept that we have to do, we're taught, again, your belief system from the cradle to the grave. You're taught that you have to be better at everything that you do than some of your other counterparts. We are taught that from the very beginning. You've got to be better, you've got to strive harder, you've got to make more money, you've got it. That's been put in us. And that's been put in us because it's so sad. Well, let me break it down this way, because I got to try to do this, because I really want you to get it, and I don't want you to get it wrong. One of the things that I always admired about our brothers and sisters who came over on the slave ships but landed in the West Indies was that West Indian people weren't totally robbed of their history. They still know that they came over here but that they were kings and queens and that they lived royal lives from whence they came. A lot of people who came over here and were dumped off in this country and most of us kind of lived in a lot of the southern regions, we weren't given that. I remember my daughter won an essay contest because I helped her a little bit with it, because she was supposed to give an essay. They were having, um, you know, like foods with your heritage from all around the world or something, and, and you were supposed to make a dish from your country. And we made a pound cake. But then we told them that this pound cake was something that we learned how to make, but we can't tell you that it's from our country because we really were robbed from what was made in our country. Okay, and that's true. Now, I'm not saying that like it's a horrible thing and, and I don't, please do not misunderstand me. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that every single one of us that's sitting here, you are just seeing whatever house we live in, the true spirit of who we are, we do not see and we will not see until we receive our glorified bodies and we go and we live, you know, with the Lord. I get that. But what I am saying is, because we are in this world, we have had to deal with certain things. And we have a tendency sometimes to just accept the scraps from the table. So therefore, a lot of people look at their salvation like it was something that Jesus did for them too. You know, like you didn't get to sit at the full banquet and receive everything, but you can take the little crumbs off the table and that's okay. Well, no, it is not okay. That table was set for you. The same way it was set for the disciples. The same way it was set for anybody. But you have to go back to how you began to think from a child and receive it and not just look at it like you were some second class citizen and you just have to get whatever scraps are off the table. Now I'm gonna tell you something else. The time in which we're living right now, <laughs> we are almost being forced to think like it used to be back in the 50s and 60s when we were coming home and I was a little girl looking, on, looking at TV and seeing them bring out the dogs and the fire hoses and all the rest of that. We see people around us dying and nothing is being done, nothing is being said, and it seems like, oh, it's okay. No, it is not okay. But here's the trick of the enemy on top of that. If he can get you to become desensitized to that, then he can also get you to become desensitized to your salvation and all the benefits that are in that salvation. And if he can get you to be desensitized to that, then you're never going to see yourself as a joint heir with Jesus or with the Most High God. And if he can do that, then he got, he has you right where he wants you. You will never have all that God has for you because you can't see it because you think you're just supposed to accept and receive and be comfortable with whatever you're going to get from the master's table and by and by when it's all said and done you get to have your mansion in the sky that is not what the word says and i need you to see that because 
I don't give a care if we bring the apostle up here to teach, Pastor Fred up here to teach, Baltimore up here to teach. You can bring whomever you want up here to teach. If you don't know who you are in Christ Jesus, it's all for naught. It is all for naught. I want you to get that. I pray that you get that because I want all of us to have all that God wants for us. He wants us during this time, and you have to admit, we need the anointing during this time that we are living in because there are things going on that I'm telling you, I would have never imagined to see, okay? We have got to know like we know our name, even better than we know our name. We've got to know that we are joint heirs. And if we know that, then we can accept and receive the anointing placed upon our lives. Then we can begin to better understand it. And then we can know, no matter what, we can get up every single day of our life and know that we win. Praise God. Well, guess what? <laughs> I ran out of time. <laughs> so we'll have to continue this. Praise God. Thanks for joining us. Our hope is that you received something that you can apply to your life and strengthen your faith. At Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, we believe that the Word of God is practical for everyday application. If you'd like to support the ministry with your tithe and offering, you can mail them to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. We also offer the convenience of mobile and online giving. It's safe and secure. Try it now. From your smartphone, simply text East G to 28950 and follow the prompts. You can even specify a designation for your gift. Text East G for general donation, East T for tithe, East O for offering, or East AL to donate to the Apostles Library. Each transaction needs to be its own individual text message. You can also visit our website, CrenshawChristianCenterEast.org, and click the Give tab to begin your experience. Set up recurring donations or give one-time gifts. This giving method is easy to use, safe and secure, and requires a one-time registration only. After your first gift, giving will be completely simple. Simply text East G to 28950 with your information securely stored. We appreciate your continued support and stand in agreement with you for the manifold return on your life. Thanks again for watching. And remember, we walk by faith, not by sight. We would like you, our viewers and partners, to join us in honoring the legacy of the Apostle by making a donation to the Apostle Frederick K.C. Price Library. The library will be on the grounds of the Faith Dome in Los Angeles, California, and it will be open to the public. It will be a place of study, learning, and research, available for anyone desiring to further their knowledge and understanding of the Christian faith. Visitors will also have a chance to learn more about our founder and his impact on the body of Christ and the world at large. You can mail your donations to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. If you are giving by check, be sure to designate in the memo area, Apostles Library. If you have Crenshaw Christian Center envelopes, you can mark AL on the envelope. You can also donate via your smartphone by texting East AL to 28950 and follow the prompts. We thank you in advance for your support. And as always, we stand in agreement for the manifold return in your life.